we begin our um, our session of the Indic Academy's uh, exploration of Ayurveda uh, with um, a set or a suite of subjects that has very much to do with Ayurveda in our contemporary era and with contemporaneous issues, subjects, and perhaps problems, uh, or perhaps most certainly problems that we have to confront and deal with and solve in our own way. Um, so our webinar today examines Ayurveda and contemporary patterns and drivers of healthcare, how Ayurveda is influenced by and in turn influences the many aspects that come under the rubric of what we call health and what we understand as health. Uh, these include India's public health system, diagnosis and treatment pathways, the patient's menu of choices, bias and prejudice between health philosophies, by which we generally mean the Indian systems of medicine and uh, what uh, some of our Vaidya still called English medicine the complex matter of regulation and governance. And uh, in today's time given to us, we will examine three interlinked subjects, public perception about Ayurveda, Ayurveda and global health crises, emerging policies and regulations and their impact on Ayurveda. Um, I'm delighted to say that each of our panelists and speakers is particularly well suited to provide an informed perspective on one of the three subjects. Uh, for this format today, we will uh, depart in a manner that I think suits uh, what we have to cover, which is the interlinkages between our three subjects, which we would like to bring out for you um, and explain that Ayurveda in India and therefore Ayurveda for the world is at a uh, inflection point, which needs a lot of consideration and a lot of the marshalling of experience, which will help us plot our pathway ahead. Uh, so although we will roughly divide our time between four quarters, three quarters for the three themes and a final synthetic synthesis of, uh, of the discussion, we will nevertheless uh, not keep it as uh, three separate lectures, it will be a conversation in all three. Um, and uh, that is the way that we, we believe that uh, we will be able to bring out the strengths and the experiences of our participants uh, in the best manner. And uh, therefore, uh, we would like to begin with uh, our first uh, broad theme, which is um, Ayurveda, <coughs> excuse me, Ayurveda and the public perception about it. And uh, anchoring this part of the discussion will be Dr. Mala Kapadia, who is a, a professor and a resident mentor at the Rashtram School of Public Leadership. She has also spent 15 years with the SPGN School of Global Management and uh, is, uh, I would say, admirably suited to being able to inform us on this theme. Um, and what I'd like to do is to be able to present each panelist uh, in the theme that they've been given with one or perhaps two or maybe even three uh, provocations in the direction that we would like this discussion to go. Uh, therefore, Malaji, may I, may I therefore uh, bowl you the first ball, which is um, to provide, provide for us a, let's call it a citizen's personal map of health, treatment, wellness, and what we understand as medicine in today's India, which may be seen as urban, but is also rural with aspirations to urbanity. Uh, so if I could ask you to uh, launch our 
program today with uh, a short dilation on this particular question. Namaskar. Thank you so much, Rahul. And I thank the Soft Power uh, 2020, Ayushman 2020, uh, for choosing this progression of themes. So we started with Parivartan, the wings of change, uh, and how Ayurveda is very relevant in today's pandemic times and going global beyond India. Uh, we also, the last weekend, those who were there would have heard uh, eminent speakers talk of the history of Ayurveda. Uh, and it was wonderful to understand how uh, our entire Indic culture, uh, I would not just say India, but the entire Indic culture has been very, very much rooted in macrocosm to microcosm. So when we talk of Ayurveda and the public perception, I would say at the moment, it's very bipolar. Uh, you know, on one side, there are a lot of people, uh, either rural or urban, I don't see that too much of a divide uh, in this perception. But on one perception, people think it's, it's a quackery. Uh, it, it, it's not a science. It's a folk tradition. Uh, what we say, dadi ma ke nukse, right? So this is what traditionally grandmothers used to like have a, you know, turmeric milk, which has become a golden latte and therefore the most preferred drink uh, for the, you know, the fashionable or a fad. But on other side, people don't really believe in it, don't trust it. Uh, they see it as a herbal medicine, not realizing that Ayurveda, first of all, I won't even call it a medicinal science. Uh, the way the word Ayurveda, Ayu and Veda, and Ayu is life. How do we live life? And how do we live life holistically? So it's an entire science which helps us live with our integrated self, which is the body, mind, uh, all of our senses, entire well-being at a physical and a psychological and also sociological and cosmological level. You know, it's, it's a very integrated science. It also gives us our worldview. So it's not about medicine. Uh, in fact, the first basic aim of Ayurveda itself is retaining the health of healthy. However, unfortunately, people either see it as, you know, it's loaded with lead and heavy metals and or it's very slow in the treatment. We don't even find good Vaidyas. We don't uh, even find good uh, Ayurvedic practitioners in my locality. So I want to uh, change my lifestyle, but I really don't know where to go. Maybe it's not scientific. A lot of people think it's not a science. Uh, it's just a tradition, but not very scientific. And therefore, it's not evidence-based. Uh, also, the other misconception is that there are no side effects. So I can self-prescribe Ayurveda. Uh, it's very safe to take. And that's what we saw uh, harming people and therefore distorting the understanding of Ayurveda. Even something as simple as the Ayush Kada, when people overtook it, you know, it was overdone in the zeal to stay protected uh, from coronavirus. It created a lot of problems in the health. So it does have side effect. So I would say the public perception really needs to change. And this is where education and media has a great role to play. Uh, you know, uh, media, unfortunately, in India has not really understood Ayurveda or projected Ayurveda in its right way. Uh, and therefore, any one wrong incident of a person getting affected from whatever the treatment the person was taking is exaggerated. Uh, also, in education, we all know, and even Ayush Ministry has been talking about it, a lot of practitioners, everyone, we all know Ayurveda is still today not the first choice for somebody who wants to do a medical career. MBBS is the first choice, right? And if you don't get your admission there, then you take admission here only to become a doctor. So that perception has to change. Uh, this perception is so deeply rooted uh, that we'll have to do a lot of groundwork uh, from grassroots level to create an understanding of Ayurveda as a way of life, uh, integrate in our own life at various levels, and also 
in education, if there are a lot of careers options for Ayurveda practitioners, or uh, like we we all know that corporates today spend a lot of money on health coaching, executive coaching. And if Ayurveda can be actually integrated in a very holistic way with everything that we are doing in our life, uh, the Vartaman of Ayurveda would be wonderful, Rahul. This is just to begin with and then uh, just, we can take yeah, it forward. Thank, yes. Thanks very much, uh, Malaji. Uh, and uh, I was particularly uh, found myself in agreement with uh, your saying that the matter of the 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 deficient perception, let's say, uh, is something that uh, I think neither media nor our education system has uh, been able to address. Um, certainly, this is something that has uh, extensive historical roots um, and which goes back to really the late or rather the last quarter of the 19th century when uh, the the hospitals or the medical colleges were being set up in uh, the presidencies of the British Empire in India. Uh, and uh, it appears to me from, from the view that I have of uh, the evolution of public health in India, it appears to me that that's in fact when the, the deliberate change in perception set in. And I'd very much like to ask uh, Dr. Tangavelu and and Dr. Prashant, <coughs> sorry, Dr. Prashant Singh, to weigh in on this aspect, please, uh, if you if you will, Dr. Thangavelu. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Rahulji. Uh, very delighted to be uh, drawn into this question about education and uh, aspects of changes in perspectives. The way I look at this problem is um, from, from both from uh, the historic, deep his historic perspective about why this philosophy came about in our way of living, and also the more uh, proximal issues, which is, uh, I would say, over the last less than 100 years. And you have correctly pointed out that um, education and the styles of education has influenced our thinking about this. The big error I see is how we have somehow moved away from this continuum called health. And we, us, we have somehow been led to believe that you don't have to worry about health. You can do whatever you want on that end of the continuum. And uh, the gods in the white coats who are the people who came out of the presidency kind of system, you know, they will take care of everything. So you do whatever you want. And those people in the white coats will take care of everything. And that little change in thinking has been exploited to a point where we are today, where we look at health as a commodity, mm. or more correctly, health care as a commodity. And clearly, education is drawn into that formula. Health, health education, and for that matter, any education has become a commodity. You know? mm. So there are major errors that we have, and they have crept in. If we, if we take a bird's eye view on this thing, you will notice they have crept in over the last few decades, and it is becoming more pervasive and more corrupting in the way it is evolving. So I'm, I, there are times when I say that this COVID issue that's going on globally is a good thing because it is, it's put the brakes on many of those unwanted developments, including styles and matters of education and will should make us rethink, like what we are doing here, should make us come into those areas. Now, I want to give you one small example of where uh, we might enable a correction. And that correction is drawn out of this kind of pessimistic image that's being promoted by the press. So I want to touch on the point that uh, Malaji said, that the press is a culprit here. You know? um, 
there has been a lot of talk recently the past weeks about, and particularly about the news item in the Gazette about uh, uh, Ayurveda doctors being permitted to do surgery, etc. Now I want to use that example as a, as a way to force a very important point that the time has arrived for creating the elite in medical education and the so-called health arena. And this might have to come out of places, respected places like uh, Banaras Hindu University in uh, uh, Varanasi, who have been mandated to do this work, but somehow it hasn't happened. The, the Institute for Medical Science in BHU in Varanasi is a very special uh, institution. It has been mandated to enable this uh, integration, but somehow it has not materialized. So I give you another example. In Delhi, uh, there is the Tibia College, and the Tibia College is a very respected old institution that was set up by one of the sons or grandsons of the Hakim of the last emperor. And his vision was a very simple vision that there needs to be an integration of the Yunani and the Ayurvedic systems because there was some, so much in common between these two. And it is there, the institution is there, the philosophy is there, but somehow none of this gets projected in narratives that are happening. None of this gets projected in discussions. Uh, we are leaders in many ways when it comes to aspects of where global health wants to go. So I feel optimistic that we can bring about change in some key institutions to develop the education and the enlightened elite for the future. So what Malaji says is very interesting that you know it's only the second rate students who not having got into the modern Western Medical College, go into Ayurveda. But that correction can be enabled if we say, okay, here is the elite school, just like the Indian Institute of Management across many parts of India. Yeah. We develop a, a, a new way of thinking about health, not health care. Okay. Now, I want to warn you that there are two <laughs> separate things here. One is health and one is health care. And when healthcare gets corrupted, we get to the state where we are today, which is commercialized healthcare, which is just a business. And then there is the extreme form of that, which is the big vaccine um, thievery, as I call it, that's happening around <laughs> the world. Sorry to be well, so blunt thank, and so frank, but there No, I think I, I, I very much appreciate it. It's, uh, I think it's long past the time for being diplomatic about diplomatic. these things. Uh, we have to call a spade a spade and we have to call a syringe a syringe. Uh, and uh, I'd very much like uh, uh, Dr. Prashant says, who is many roles has been able to straddle uh, both uh, an emerging paradigm of education and therefore public leadership with which he is involved, but also bring his uh, considerable knowledge and wisdom from the industry sector to, to address this part. Do you think that there is scope within the, the education system from now till a decade hence, where we can see this kind of correction coming in for the problem that Malaji identified and for the sort of solution that uh, Dr. Tangavelu has talked about. Dr. Singh, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rahulji. Uh, just a small correction. I, uh, you know, my years in industry prevented me from doing a PhD or being a doctor of medicine. So uh, my apologies uh, if there's any confusion on, 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 on the other side. Uh, just upfront disclaimer. Uh, but having uh, come in, uh, to uh, look at this field and looking at uh, doing a, a sort of a root cause analysis in terms of uh, uh, why are we here in terms of why is the public perception, as Malaji said, uh, ranging from a dark skepticism or ridicule towards Ayurveda, or at the best, there is a, a, a very high respect and regard for Ayurveda in the general public in certain segments, but it's based uh, on faith, as a matter of faith. It's not based as a matter of knowledge. 
And that brings us to the question that uh, Rahul Ji said, that is it, um, you know, uh, and what is it that we have to do in education to kind of, uh, you know, look at this. So one of the things that really has happened is that uh, uh, education uh, uh, in some way also like uh, uh, Madhan Tangabelu Ji mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, healthcare became a business. So in some form, education became a business too. And education uh, contained uh, elements of weaponization against Ayurveda. And more fundamentally, uh, the education sector uh, uh, worked as a, a proxy for a lot of the embedding a lot of the sockets for emerging businesses on the pharma, medical sciences. So that weaponization kind of served uh, the whole ecosystem uh, of corrupting and uh, descending our uh, paradigm from health to healthcare to uh, essentially becoming captive customers of a, a very predatory healthcare system over time. So I think that's going to kind of, uh, you know, uh, has to be reversed. Uh, is it going to happen in 10 years? Uh, possibly not. Uh, because the roots of this healthcare system essentially came in uh, and it has its seeds from the uh, Renaissance period in, in Europe and uh, the split between uh, the church because uh, at the time modern Western education had to move itself away uh, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the forces of the church. So a truce was uh, uh, kind of realized at that point of time, which I would call uh, the Descartian, or the Cartian, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 limit, where uh, the uh, the limits of education were put at at the layer of rationality and reason, and anything else that kind of got above that mental construct was not the domain of education, and that uh, foundational program led to the divorce of. Uh, education from the forces of uh, uh, life, uh, understanding the life forces that are behind uh, and, uh, you know, creating a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, conflicts in the, in the modern sciences. So I think that the sooner we are able to include the understanding of uh, the principles of life force uh, and uh, uh, since there is a significant account, amount of accumulated ignorance or resistance and uh, weaponization against understanding fundamental principles of life force. So we have to probably look at uh, not just the current education system, but we have to kind of create a core uh, platform to the education system to inject into this uh, education system uh, a, a much more deeper understanding of the principles of life force. Uh, and where do we get this from? I think that comes in from the understanding of the sciences that drive Ayurveda, which drive uh, the yoga practices, the Vedic uh, knowledge systems, because that's one of the repositories which contains uh, a significant amount of accumulated knowledge, wisdom, uh, you know, and basis on the of the life force principles. So I think that's going to kind of, uh, you know, has to kind of come in. And we need to kind of engage in with the traditional schools, co-opt them into uh, this mode of uh, uh, bolting on into the education system and injecting into the education system through a variety of interventions that must be designed. People must sit together and design these interventions and uh, an ecosystem of broad basing that has to kind of flow in. And when we do that, that is probably the time when we will succeed in getting the elite students as Malaji and uh, uh, Dr. Madhat Tanga Veluji mentioned, uh, we need the best minds to come in and address the most pressing problems. And these are, these are some of the most pressing problems right now, restoration of health in humanity. Thank you, Prashantji. Thank you. I particularly like the uh, the uh, 
the term that you used of uh, the element of weaponization against uh, understanding, I think uh, I'd like to just park that for perhaps uh, later in the uh, in our session when we do our synthesis. I think that's uh, something that uh, we really need to put our heads together about as to what that means and, and how do we combat that. Uh, I quite agree with um, your, your uh, description of the who, uh, the the conceptual field of Western education of rationality and reason. And I think, uh, uh, you know, you, the three panelists may correct me if I'm wrong. I think that is one of the, the um, changes that occurred, which in fact conspired uh, to push away the herbal, the natural tradition that existed in Europe itself to the margins when the industrial revolution uh, came about. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tangavelu is probably in a good position to, to, to chat about that. Um, but I'd like to return to uh, Malaji in, to respond to what uh, your two other panelists have said. Yes, Rahul. Uh, of course, Madanji and Prashanji both uh, have raised very valid issues. And what I feel is that uh, we as Indians, you know, I mean, at one side, you rightly pointed out that the, uh, the British Raj, uh, the grants to Ayurvedic colleges was stopped, right? And we know historically, the education of Ayurveda or Yunani was sidelined. Uh, Siddha was anyway a very a traditional uh, guru shishya based uh, and not to be taught into the colleges kind of a tradition. However, what I realize and I want our Indian people who feel that Ayurveda is not scientific to understand that if this was so, what are all our old manuscripts doing in those British museums and libraries? If they were so unscientific, uh, why did they even take them with uh, themselves? And we don't have them. We don't have access to them. Isn't that surprising? You know, and post-independence, the saddest part is that we Indians did not really revive. It was only way back in 2014 that the Ministry of Ayush was established. <clears throat> Till then, we never gave, you know, any importance to our own way of uh, life or medical systems, even if you limit Ayurveda to a medical system, we never revived it. We never looked at it scientifically. And uh, Dr. Nagaraj Paturi ji is here. Uh, he, he would be in a better position to expand on this. But people who say that Ayurveda is either, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I felt bad when even the best of the speakers say that it's mythology. You know, the beginning of Ayurveda is in mythology. Why? Because we don't understand our own history. You know, and when, when in Ayurveda books, they say that Brahma, it originated with Brahma and Brahma also remembered. So it's not about a science uh, which we evolved, but it's kind of a cosmic science which is there in the universe. It's like, I mean, how you buy a telephone or a television or any equipment and you get a manual with it, right? So the moment the universe is created, how to live here, how to have a long life, a well-being life and a coexistence which is interdependent, that entire manual was there and Brahma only remembered it. And then passed it on to uh, others, you know, Daksha Prajapati and Indra to Bharadwaj and others. However, it's unfortunate that we teach our own science as mythology. This is not mythology. This is itihasa. This has happened. Mm -hmm. And the moment we take pride into the celestial roots from where our knowledge system has come up, which only needs for us to be understood scientifically. It is very scientific. It is evidence-based. It's sad that we have lost that connection that how do you explain it scientifically? And it's very weird, Rahul, but only a week ago, uh, I was invited by a university and they were doing seminars uh, on uh, NEP 2020. 
and I was invited to talk on careers uh, based on Ayurveda and uh, other uh, elite uh, traditional uh, wisdom. And very surprisingly, when we started making a checklist of the careers that are possible, however, they are not actually seen as careers today. Even the students were surprised. There is a lot of possibility to revive Ayurveda in a very scientific way, uh, in a very entrepreneurial way. And I love what Madanji says, and I've repeated quoting him again and again, that healthcare and health are different. And we need to remind ourselves that same thing. Uh, unfortunately, you see even uh, Ayurveda presentations being done as a trillion dollar business. You know, we are, we are forgetting uh, the, the basic soft power. When we say soft power, uh, what is a soft power? Soft power comes from culture and way of life. And it comes from people promoting it, right? Soft power doesn't come from the government promoting it. The soft power comes from the narratives of people of that country. And for us, and especially in the pandemic times, where we are, as Prashanji rightly said, post-industrial revolution, uh, you know, where we have ended up in a pandemic time due to the greed and uh, lobe. I mean, in Ayurveda, in fact, there is a whole chapter in Vimanasana on pandemic. And why does a pandemic happen? When you go back, it happens because of climate change. Why would a climate change happen? Because of greed of human beings. And why would greed happen? Because of our adharmic living. So there is such a beautiful chain of events that have happened post-industrial revolution. And the best way to come out of pandemic, according to Charaka Samhita, is live our dharma. It's, it's so beautiful and profound. And I don't know how we all can, you know, the new normal that people have been talking about, that new normal can be our way of dharmic living. Thank you very much, Sir Malaji. Well, I personally prefer the previous to the old normal uh, if I had a choice. Uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, once again, you've touched on the industrial revolution as a, as a kind of watershed. And uh, this, is, this is probably something that was visited upon us during the, uh, the latter stage of the British colonial occupation. Uh, you did say at, at the, uh, in your last statements about these being the Erdharmic manifestations uh, sets uh, the tone really for the next uh, half an hour segment that we have, which is the global disease burden or the crises of diseases, multiple crises of diseases and Ayurveda, uh, for which <clears throat> our Special panelist is Dr. Madan Tangavelu, the General Secretary and Research Director of the European Ayurveda Association, and who brings a wealth of experience, expertise, and wisdom in, into the subject. And <clears throat> to Dr. Tangavelu, I would really uh, begin with, uh, with uh, querying you about the preparedness of the Ayurvedic system, delivery system that we have, uh, whether in India or its uh, derivatives elsewhere, in, in being able to respond to the, the great demands of those uh, who are suffering from one or more of the non-communicable diseases which have emerged, especially in the last, I would say, in the what, what we call the postmodern era. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raji. The, uh, I'm going to try a little bit in my kind of broken Hindi, and this might convey the spirit of what I want to pass on. The, uh, the saying is, Banduk tayar hai, Banduk chala, chalane wale hai ne. So this is the state of Ayurveda. We've had the Banduk, we've had that weapon that we want to use to get people health for <laughs> thousands of years, you know. Magar wale So we don't have the people who know how to use that 
weapon. So this, mm -hmm. in essence, is what I just want to elaborate on. And I want to start with, uh, I want to use this because people are very aware of this ongoing pandemic. And I want to use this as an example. And I want to touch on uh, the fact that here's a simple virus that is going around the world. It's been wherever it came from, it's there with us. It's cost a lot of mortality. It's causing a lot of um, discomfort for governments around the world. People, of course, are completely at a loss. And uh, one of the consequences of this is what we are learning now. The many, many new aspects of the pathology of this disease is coming through now. And one of the things that's coming out is that of um, what we call post-COVID or long COVID. One in every 20 people who have been affected by this are showing continuing symptoms of this problem. So when we look at the total bulk of um, the uh, COVID related issues, post COVID or long COVID as they're called in different parts of the world is going to be a big problem. And what we know is a very heterogeneous set of conditions that they're present with. You know, they're all, some of them are showing the same breathlessness or fatigue or headaches or difficulty in sleeping. And it's just opened up a huge number of things. And this is going to stay with us. And when we go into countries like Italy or here in the UK, this is a major problem that the health service has no handle on. It doesn't know what to do. And Ayurveda has a, a way in addressing these complex pathologies. So uh, I, I want to mention here that on the 18th of December, the Ayush Valley Foundation will be holding uh, an event to look at how Ayurveda is being used to address uh, the post-COVID, long COVID problem. Medical Research Council of the UK, along with the UK India Research Initiative is running a big program on this. So this is the, uh, one of the immediate kind of issues coming out of COVID. Now, let us look at that ironic thing that the whole world is talking about. It wants, it's talking about food. And I want to touch on one aspect of food that comes out of excess food and the wrong kind of food, which is obesity. There is a pandemic here. People don't realize the scale of the obesity pandemic in the world. It is many times graver than what this simple virus-based pandemic is doing to humans. And this is going to be a nightmare for everybody because the spin out of this will be conditioned, so many other conditions, inflammatory problems, you know, and particularly for countries that have um, young populations. So I'm talking about the entire continent of Africa, 55 countries where there is a very young population and they're all being hit by the greed of the food industry who want to feed everybody industrial food to a point where people are disconnected from the land. They don't know how to grow food because they are somehow sold into this promise of we will give you everything. And that in turn gives rise to metabolic diseases and all kinds of other complications. So this is where we have. We we have a problem here. When we go into America with the world's largest health budget, I would say just about everybody is metabolically unstable. And these are facts. And I think when we come to this global arena where we are expected to engage now, then first of all, we must be aware of these facts, that this is where it is. I want to give you another graphic example uh, and this comes from Belgium. 25% of teenagers in Belgium are suicidal. We can't even, it, sitting in India, we cannot yeah. even imagine that children can be suicidal. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Yes. There are research programs that you know. So this is the this is the connection that we have to make, Raji. You know, when we if we are preparing to go into the global arena, and if we are going out there saying we have a solution for this and we can solve this problem, and fortunately there is 
there are groups who are working at that level. And I want to highlight two groups. There is one, uh, you will find information on the website, one is called Hippocampus. It's a group looking at using yoga with teenagers to improve mental health and to get rid of these problems. There are no drugs for these things. You know. Ritalin and all these kind of things, they're just gimmicks, basically. They just make things worse for children. When in fact, what is needed is a slightly more balanced life. So if we move our radar into each country, so I give you another example. If you go into Eastern Europe, again, a quarter of the children who are born are autistic. This is a, pop, this is a public health problem. We don't think about it. And there are issues like this in every nation that you want to move through. So if as a group, we come together and we say, this is the examination that we need to do. We need to go across, understand cultures, understand the existing problems, uh, health related problems, and we can unpack and we should enable that dialogue between where we are and what we have with those weapons that we have, those 5,000 year old weapons that we have, learn how to engage, use them, you know, polish them, learn how to use them and bring them into play in different places. And for this, I do want to make a comment here. The, if we are globalizing, if we're going out, we must also be inwardly receptive. So we must be able to do this two-way dialogue between going out to people and bringing people to us, number one. The second thing, we, need, we will need a lot of help from New Delhi. Uh, once again, I'm going to be very blunt here. <laughs> and in particular, the Ministry of External Affairs, we need a lot, much more interaction, a proactive interaction. And we are very happy to note that the Minister of Ayush, Sri Padnaik Lee, is also Minister of State for Defense. So that is a good thing. But we now want to see how we can extend this in that new form, not in terms of uh, Raphael jets or MiG-29s or whatever we want to buy, but what is it that we can put out which is as, uh, as, as vibrant as those Raphael jets and those Bofors and those, you know, uh, combat helicopters that we are interested in. We have something to give every nation of the world, every continent of the world. We have something that is more potent and much more uh, useful than all of these other gimmicks, you know. So this is my feeling from where I am seated sure. here in Cambridge right now. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madanji. I must uh, I must confess outright that I was uh, completely taken aback to listen to what you said about uh, Belgium and Eastern Europe. I had absolutely no idea that the scale of uh, these uh, difficulties for the children, especially children, teenagers, the youth, uh, had gone to that level in these areas. And I think that probably uh, tells us that what we um, what we can Consider as the usual bouquet of uh, non-communicable business is in fact uh, not equipped enough to understand what has happened to these populations. And indeed, as you said uh, uh, concerning, uh, I was very happy that also that you mentioned the connection between the, the industrialization of food uh, and the obesity pandemic, which is uh, a far longer one, a far bigger one. Um, may I ask, uh, if, I may, well, if I may just then, add, yes, of course. If, I, if I may just add one point, I kept pushing the Ministry of External Affairs, that button. Why am I pushing that? Because any engagement outside India has to be mediated through the Ministry of External Affairs. And so it is partly for us, I think we haven't done enough to understand how that mechanism works. And we have to learn about that. And we must enthuse them to 
give us insights. So whenever we throw things like this on the table, we must then go to the ministry saying, you know, by the way, what's happening in Poland in terms of autism and what can we do? So that is, it's a kind of a new way of dialoguing with these things. And you're I quite think it's, right. You're quite it's right. Not impossible. It's not impossible. Yeah. It must become part of that uh, intergovernment dialogue. You know, whenever we have intergovernment dialogue, then this must be in the agenda somewhere. Thank you. Very true. And uh, in fact, the Center for Soft Power is uh, one of the channels which I think will be able to bring that together and deliver it uh, to the right uh, years in the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, and this is something that I think Indic Academy uh, will be very well suited to take up. Thank you. Um, if, uh, yes, but I very much appreciate your making that link so strongly between industrialization of food and the, the different sorts of uh, pandemics that we are seeing, which are not, as you said, not being recognized as such, simply because the powers that be uh, are often co-investors in both these spaces, the commoditization of health and, of course, the commoditization of a very small set of crops from which most of our foods are derived. Uh, Malaji, I would uh, ask you to please bring your... Uh, your thoughts um, on some of the key points that uh, Madanji has raised about this, especially the, the as he said, the banduk tayar hai, banduk chalane wale gai ho gaye. So if you would. No, thank you, Rahul. Absolutely, Madanji. That was brilliant. Honestly, I mean, I, I truly believe ki banduk tayar hai. So I would, I would go back to uh, what Ayurveda, I, I defined Ayurveda as. And what he shared for Belgium and the industrialization of food. Uh, I mean, two, three things have happened. You know, one, uh, because of the industrialization of food, we have cut off our roots from nature, right? From mother nature. So there is no organic food. Even the farming has farming, uh, process of farming is also industrialized. Uh, and what we don't realize is that the they actually, the nutrition from the food, from the soil is gone down. I mean, nobody has even thought over the years that food was supposed to be giving us nutrition. Why is everyone taking health supplements? I mean, you're, if you're, why have our food stopped giving us the nutrition, right? Uh, why do we need to take supplement along with the food we eat? Uh, Two, obesity is connected, and this is where Ayurveda beautifully explains causes of obesity, and I had done some research on this, that obesity is connected with uh, excess fat in our body, right? The medha, the medho dhatu in our body is uh, ex in excess. So, of course, the food and wrong lifestyle uh, and genetics, they contribute to it. But one of the very significant reason for the younger generation to get into obesity is lack of love and protection at home. I mean, with, uh, you know, both the parents going out to work. Uh, uh, I mean, one full generation and even the next generation has become a latchkey generation. So when young kids, they come home, one, there are no joint families. There are nano families right there may not be even both parents uh, there could be a single parent and the person at work so what has happened is uh, when you don't feel enough love protection security in your life you turn to a secondary you know uh, satisfaction which is food and ayurveda says that the sweet taste gives you that protection so we indulge into food which is excess and sweet taste, you know, and, and that's the unfortunate part that we don't realize, but people munch on salty and sweet together. Uh, a lot of Viruddha Ahar according to Ayurveda. Malaji, I, I think uh, that what you said is, is generally called, uh, popularly called comfort food nowadays. Absolutely. Yeah, and we be branded as comfort food, right? So it's mood enhancing food, right? So eat a chocolate. And, and as I said, the media and uh, their creative geniuses are unfortunately used in a very negative way, right? 
So, uh, you know, uh, if you're not feeling well uh, or if your self-esteem is low, you turn to foods rather than uh, the right healthy choices. So, uh, you know, somewhere uh, health is being neglected, uh, compromised. Uh, like a simple example, uh, I was very shocked to see that serotonin and melatonin are also available as supplements. These are the hormones of happiness and hormone that help you sleep well. They should be secreted naturally in our body because of lifestyle. Unfortunately, our lifestyle is so wrong and which we don't want to correct, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, what you, you are told by your doctor is it's okay. Uh, you know, this will enhance your mood. Take a serotonin uh, capsule every day. Or if you're not sleeping well, don't correct your lifestyle. But take melatonin tablets and you'll sleep better. So that entire de-link from mother nature, also the circadian rhythm, the dinacharya, or the ritacharya that Ayurveda has been talking about. We have gone so away. I mean, uh, I, I ask many of my own uh, Ayurveda practitioner friends that how many of you practice Swastavritta? How many of you practice Dhinacharya? They teach that, right? Uh, how many of them really practice it? And that is the sad part. So the, the crisis of suicidal tendency that Madanji was talking about is, is so complicated at one level, but it is so simple as another level. You know, what we need is a touch or the love or the hugging of a mother. Uh, but we are living in too much of a Rajasic time where the entire vata and pitta and kapha, all the doshas are, you know, vitiated. And instead of bringing the doshas in balance uh, with lifestyle and a family relationship, we are indulging more and more into a lifestyle which takes us away from health. Uh, thank you, Madhaji. Uh, yes, uh bit of a gloomy prognosis there and a lot of it has uh, leads us back to as you said the the nutrition that soil has to give us has been replaced by uh, this, this uh, um, rather blended with product and yield in terms of volume and quantity and mass but not really the rasa and the bhuta uh, at, at this point, um, I'd like to ask uh, Prashantji, um, especially with your uh, your view on the the ability for private sector for for research organizations to be able to, uh, in fact, be the nuts and bolts of uh, a public health policy that extends really what the Ministry of External Affairs ought to be doing and should be doing uh, at, in a, at a much more active scale uh, in our neighborhood, if not in, in our areas of interest, uh, to pick up from what Madanji had talked about. Um, how do you see this uh, being broached with them and how do you see uh, ideally them, the, the ministry, uh, through its diplomatic channels and through the Indian missions abroad, uh, being able to uh, take this as a campaign? I think that's a very pertinent question because uh, the, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Madan Tangaveluji mentioned, the burden of disease is actually uh, increasing in uh, Europe, Africa, and uh, North America, and many other so societies on an industrial scale because you have industrial food, industrial agriculture, uh, industrial scale programming of mines, and you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as you mentioned, an industrial scale uh, uh, appropriation of education to push this. So everything is kind of multiplying and, uh, you know, kind of creating an exponential rise in the burden of disease that has to be kind of cleared. And that itself is becoming an opportunity from a business perspective for Ayurveda to kind of systematically look at uh, you know, addressing. And uh, it's not only good health, I think it's also, uh, you know, a good economic opportunity for 
people to kind of look at in, uh, uh, in terms of policy. Now, to be able to do that, uh, I think the challenge is not just the Ministry of uh, uh, external affairs. I think they have uh, a very difficult task if they just rely upon the MEA to go out and create an outreach program for Ayurveda. Uh, the, the biggest opportunity for Ayurveda, I mean, as everybody I mean, has heard that statement, physician, uh, heal thyself. So I think the first thing that we probably really need to do in terms of sequencing that thing, and I'm not saying that it's a serial sequencing, these can be all parallel, but in terms of prioritizing the whole thing, we need to have a very, very strong uh, domestic uh, healthcare policy, which integrates and includes uh, Ayurveda principles and protocols at the core of its public health uh, program, uh, starting from food, soil, environment, because the scope of Ayurveda is very, very vast. And it uh, kind of goes across into the education, certification, and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the, the, we, we'll, we'll discuss this as we kind of go on, but I think it really creates a space for creating the kind of capacity that we need to have to support the, the uh, Ministry of Ex External Affairs, uh, uh, you know, uh, task at hand uh, for India to become to becoming a net exporter of wellness, wellness knowledge and wellness uh, treatments uh, to, to, to the world. So I think that that's the place where we really need to kind of, uh, you know, look at creating the internal capacity, internal policy development, and make it easier for them to kind of showcase this and, and, and take this forward. Yeah, I think uh, Prashantji, that is a winning, uh, I think that's a winning slogan, net exporter of wellness. Uh, that's something that I think uh, needs to be put up in every Indian mission abroad. But uh, as you said, as you said, and I think uh, this is this is something that uh, general so society at large and as well as administrators are somehow divorced from that the capacity that ought to be brought to the table and ought to be rolled out depends entirely on the holistic understanding of what underlies what we produce as the medicinal basis, which means we have to look after our soil, we have to look after our water, we have to look after our forests, uh, because that's where all the wild relatives of what we cultivate as our Ayurvedic uh, pharmacopoeia, that's where it resides. Uh, so indeed, we need to do this. Uh, frankly, between you, me and everybody else, I don't see the required amount of it uh, being manifested within our governance structures. I do think uh, it's not out of reach, it's possible. And once again, perhaps uh, the, the uh, consortium of centers that together makes up Indic Academy is uh, well positioned to be able to do that. Let's, uh, let's put that idea on the back burner for a while, Prashanti, while I ask you to uh, continue to start as it were, uh, because our third segment is coming up, which is in fact, uh, the segment on policies and regulations. Um, when, when conceiving this uh, today's session, we had questions about the ownership of method, about intellectual property, about access and benefit sharing, about the industrial acquisition of the components of Ayurveda, which uh, like all traditional medicinal systems all around the world have loomed much larger in our generation. and. Uh, we thought that uh, there is a difficult dialogue which lies at the heart of uh, this question, which is to whom does Ayurveda belong? And therefore, to whom who can speak for it with some authority? Um, the state attempts to strike a balance, but uh, uh, perhaps it is successful in some areas, perhaps it is not in other areas. And uh, to that degree, I would like to ask you, um, with your with your uh, knowledge and your experience uh, when we talk about frameworks and standards that need to be adopted uh, especially in in the pharmacological realm as well as the delivery realm as well as especially standards and qualities uh, who ought to do this why who ought to stay away and why 
Thank you, Rahul. I think that's a very, very, uh, you know, a key question. And uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's an area where I think the sovereignty of Ayurveda is actually uh, the, the issue over here. Uh, uh, as Malaji had mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, the whole Ayurveda thing is looked as, at as Nanika, uh, Tadimata, Luksa, or uh, it's looked at as a, you know, a mythical kind of, a, you know, a, a treatment system. So uh, I think the first part of it over here is to uh, first um, and foremost look at protecting our genetic uh, material uh, and diversity of the herbal and plant uh, medicine. Uh, and I say it with good reason. Uh, a few months back, Dr. Madanji and I had a long conversation on the phone where we were looking at uh, invasive technologies like CRISPR gene editing. And uh, it is of particular concern when we look at protecting the natural uh, plants and herb uh, diversity. Uh, for example, out of the roughly 10,000 uh, very important, medicinally important uh, plants and herbs, uh, India is actually a host to over uh, eight and a half to 9,000 of such varieties. And uh, the responsibility of this uh, has been now mandated with the National Medicinal Plant uh, you know, uh, Board. And uh, one of the uh, things as an independent analyst, just looking at the, uh, from an outside of the industry perspective in terms of what the what is happening with the ministry and some of the uh, agreements that it's kind of going along with uh, many of the G2G kind of agreements to ensure uh, in the interest of doubling or increasing farmer incomes, the government interventions are essentially to streamline the supply of natural plants and herbs into, uh, uh, you know, the international wellness uh, uh, supply chains because they are becoming more and more aware of the uh, strategic uh, uh, importance of these uh, treatments and ingredients into the restoration of uh, health and wellness. So, uh, however, the without doing the necessary value add and taking the Ayurveda paradigms, if you were to just do a raw material, you suffer from two reasons. One is that the international uh, supply chains will take a greater and a more predatory uh, ownership of the uh, supply chain and the supply of input form factors into critically important medicinal plants. They have all survived from a uh, lot of genetic manipulation to date because they were not considered important. But now that they're being considered important, they would be. So, and, and, and the reason this is also at stake is because the, the paradigms that they operate on is still what I would call, uh, what we call the reductionist system. So if turmeric is the, uh, you know, uh, herb, which is uh, uh, responsible for reduction in inflammation, which is a very big factor as uh, Dr. Thandogan uh, mentioned in obesity. So turmeric will find uh, gradually a larger amount of uh, missing in specialized targeted nutrients. So what happens is that sooner or later, the, uh, the academic institutions will see that, you know, curcumin, which is the active ingredient for inflammation is the important thing. So then the whole uh, drive for higher uh, so-called productivity will mean that you will start soon seeing genetically modified turmeric uh, to get you more curcumin, for example, you know, and that kind of may change the equilibrium, you know, in many unforeseen ways. So I think one of the first things that we really have to do is to protect, uh, you know, as Malaji said, one of the principles is to protect the healthy. So you also have to protect the health providing uh, herbs and medicines. So I think that is the base of the whole, uh, providing the integrity to the pharmacopoeia uh, system that you mentioned in your question. Now we look at it, uh, at it from another perspective and that is the uh, Ayurveda pharmacopoeia in our 
uh, uh, literature uh, and, uh, from, from our ancient uh, texts uh, from uh, uh, all, you know the entire comp compilation and some of those sources are lying in India some of them have gone abroad some of them have got lost forever but it's important to uh, retain what we have protect what we have and prevent uh, as I mentioned uh, genetic pollution uh, of, uh, of this raw material because that's the foundation for restoring the overburden of disease that is kind of piling up on an industrial scale. So we have to kind of, that's the first starting point. The second starting point, point on that sequence is to look at the pharmacopoeia and start digitizing that. Um, unfortunately, what's happened is the ownership and uh, of the Ayurveda pharmacopoeia system has now been handed over. In fact, as recently as in June, July of this year, by the extended group of secretaries in the Union Cabinet Ministry, uh, into um, the hands of the uh, Health Ministry and uh, the ICMR uh, folks and the other, and along, it is along with the pharmacopoeia of the allopathy systems. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, literally asking, uh, you know, the foxes to go and guard the, the hens, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a situation which has happened. And unfortunately, uh, to my surprise, it's been several months, uh, and to my surprise and to my, uh, as far as I know, I would be very happy to be corrected. I haven't seen uh, any uh, pushback from the Ayurveda industry fraternity. So uh, I think the ability of the industry uh, to organize itself and start protecting its critical uh, assets and the knowledge asset base uh, uh, and the plant material base is going to be of critical significance uh, as, as the starting foundational elements of, of, of getting Ayurveda uh, uh, built up. And this is something that we really need to kind of take this uh, uh, forward. Uh, so protecting the uh, pharmacopoeia is not just kind of keeping the pharmacopoeia in the um, uh, as a uh, as a dead text, but it is also necessary to contextualize, modernize, digitize, use workflow principles, and be able to provide the necessary kind of. Uh, uh, data access with the right privileges and the right structure uh, tiered access to deeper knowledge systems into this. And the pharmacopoeia has some, some of the greatest deep secrets in terms of how do we transport things like heavy metals. Today, uh, heavy metal-based heavy metal medicines containing uh, arsenic or uh, gold or lead is prohibited in the uh, Western medical systems because they simply do not know how to transport those much needed uh, elements into the human body. They go and get deposited in the wrong places and that causes the toxicity. But it's not to say that those elements are not required in the body. The, the Ayurveda pharmacopoeia systems have uh, uh, perfected through uh, millennium of uh, uh, practices, trial and error possibly in, in very, very, very high cost possibly. And they perfected that. So it's, uh, that is embedded, embodied knowledge, which, which works and it should be kind of used uh, in its own Ayurveda stack. And I think we should be more careful that it, the medicines are kind of prepared. And again, the value of the pharmacopoeia as being the reference material for certifying, testing, uh, validating the Ayurveda traditional medicine has to be kind of uh, benchmarked and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, really uh, kind of uh, brought in. And then finally, we're, we're saying uh, that- Prashanji, may, may I interrupt for just a moment? Yes. Uh, just to clarify, uh, National Medicinal Plants Board, uh, that is a statutory organ under Ayush Ministry. Yes. Uh, but what you refer to is in fact the pharmacopoeia, the Ayurvedic specific pharmacopoeia being controlled now by ICMR. Yes. Uh, yes. Could, you, could you just uh, expand on this a little bit as to how these two, how do these two work in parallel or do they work in parallel? How, how, does, it, uh, how does it add up? The, 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 the logic that was uh, given in the uh, press release at the uh, EGO statement in the press 
said that this is a more efficient way to organize, collate all of the information and the, uh, you know, the uh, management of the pharmacopoeias. After all, both are pharmacopoeias. So they will be managed together under the same management practices under an efficiency, uh, on the basis of efficiency, the, uh, you know, the thing has actually gone under that rule. Sorry, well, thanks for that. Yeah, well, um, please uh, do uh, continue because you were talking about uh, yes, at yes. that point, you know, the transportation of the heavy metals and, and yes, yes. So, uh, I, you know, so it's 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 of very, very, uh, uh, it's very important to note that uh, there is a significant amount of research, even now, that's happening sponsored by uh, uh, various educational institutes uh, located. Uh, uh, you know, on the uh, East Coast currently in, in the US, uh, to my knowledge as an independent observer, who are actually sending in doctoral, postdoctoral students doing nanotechnology uh, studies in uh, India to look at the way basmas are prepared, what are the basma recipes, how is it done, and uh, sooner or later when they perfect the way of transporting heavy metals, uh, you will see that the uh, uh, barriers to heavy metals will be removed by the US FDA and so on and so forth, which is a natural process. Today, it's not allowed because Ayurveda can do it. It's not allowed, it can't be done by the others. So it is a sort of a non-tariff uh, trade barrier, which is kind of preventing Ayurveda to kind of go in. So when you talk of the question that you said about MEA, I think the task of MEA is to really Point, we have, we'll have to kind of create the industry body and create the necessary investments for the analyst community to kind of look at this because it's not just about Ayurveda, but it is also about competition. It's also about economics. It's also about geopolitics. Uh, I mean, when I talk about the word geopolitics, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Ayurveda has significant uh, treatments for, the, uh, for mental health, suicidal, uh, kind of thing, but some of these things need to be validated. Some of these things need to be kind of uh, uh, demonstrated. And uh, India should be the place where we kind of do. Uh, one of the comments was saying that we currently are unfortunately having very high rates of uh, uh, teenage depression and suicidal. And I think we should probably uh, start, uh, you know, a national program to kind of look at this. And uh, when we look at geopolitical thing. I mean, I would like to kind of just discuss one point for the audience. Uh, why would uh, the US uh, look at, say, Afghanistan and, uh, and be there for uh, decades when it has no oil? Uh, and the real reason is that there is a significant amount of supply of opium, which is a, a substrate material uh, yeah, for uh, a large number of uh, 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 treatments in the uh, mental health uh, 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 areas. And uh, uh, that's the market and that the burden of disease is kind of creating uh, geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, disturbances. So uh, this is not just, uh, uh, you know, a burden of disease, but I think it kind of stirs um, a greater amount of uh, unrest in increasingly larger cycles and uh, increasingly uh, greater amounts of volatility. So, um, you know, to the whole thing of uh, being a next net exporter of wellness, I think if we really look at a deeper thing in terms of what we're doing on food, on uh, wellness, health, uh, I think we would also kind of help in the longer term look at uh, easing some of the uh, geopolitical stresses uh, because a lot of the forest cover is going because of poor food issues uh, as we kind of go back. The, the, the uh, earth overshoot factor shows that right now the whole earth is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, overexploited about 1.7 times, uh, you know, uh, more. I mean, if we were to kind of support our average consumption right now, we immediately need 1.7. Earths. And uh, if you really look at something like, uh, you know, uh, what China is doing, their growing prosperity has kind of caused them to con consume uh, far more what, than what their landmass can support. So they're kind of getting into that uh, thing out of a necessity, out of consumption. 
And add to that the burden of disease, it just starts driving geopolitical compulsions in, in many, many ways. Thank you, Prashantji. That's, uh, that's really a very wide uh, uh, scope, in fact, that you have outlined there. Um, but I do, uh, I do appreciate your bringing in uh, China for, for more reasons than just the, uh, their contribution as a country to Earth overshoot, which is probably, probably equals their contribution to the uh, carbon deposition in our atmosphere as a percentage. Uh, we've heard recently of uh, Chinese fishing vessels going as far as the Galapagos in search of fish. And of course, uh, they are off the coast of Nigeria as well. Uh, they were said to be off the coast of uh, Kerala two to three years ago, great big factory ships. Uh, it, this is indeed a matter of uh, the biodiversity becoming a, uh, a very strong driver of uh, geopolitical changes. Um, but um, yes, uh, net exporter of wellness, obviously we have a lot of work to do at home. Uh, I do think uh, that uh, the matter of the pharmacopoeia, the, the uh, securing of the pharmacopoeia basis, the botanical basis, is uh, something that is overdue by probably a generation. Uh, no, in fact, even more because uh, it is in the in the mid six mid to late sixties when uh, the green revolution was rolled out in the in the former states of uh, Pepsu uh, in western Uttar Pradesh, what is today Haryana and Punjab, also when uh, the uh, petrochemical-based uh, fertilizer began to be spread liberally on, on the fields. Uh, that, unfortunately, is a syndrome that persists till this day. Um, until recently, when I was associated with the Ministry of Agriculture program, uh, I did find that administrators were still looking at the per hectare fertilizer fertilizer use in China as that bench of productivity, which is, which it ought to be completely the opposite, but it isn't. And I just hope that they don't take the same approach uh, with uh, the Ayurvedic botanicals as well. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, Malaji to um, come in with her view on especially the, the, the possibility of, of uh, the public perception being swung around to taking recognition that your Ayurvedic botanicals are not like uh, allopathic or English medicine pills. They have a basis, which is a plant basis. That plant basis requires a particular care for the soil, an understanding of the soil, a ritucharya for the soil itself, for the bhumi itself. Uh, this seems to be a formidable task. How do we go about it? Oh, Rahul, uh, thank you so much for this question, but I would add one more level of complication to this. Okay, okay. Uh, or I would say complexity to this, that it's not just the soil. Of course, the soil matters a lot. Uh, and I mean, last more than 20 years, I've been attending many conferences on Ayurveda, and we are still grappling with the same issue, right? That, you know, we have contaminated soil and therefore, we are making chaman prash with amlas that are not pure organic or they are hybrid amlas or we are not we don't have forests so we don't have honey and the demand for honey has gone up so much so on one side we want to increase uh, awareness of people and therefore uh, use of ayurveda in their daily life but then you don't know the turmeric you buy in the market Maybe some pharmaceutical company has already taken out the curcumin from that. And then the turmeric that you are getting is devoid of any value in itself because the curcumin is taken away. And we all know that the curcumin tablets are marketed at such high price. So, of course, we need to work on that. And therefore, collectively, I would say it's not just an individual effort, collectively, uh, People would have to create that pressure on the pharmaceutical industry to give them the pure of whatever they are delivering, you know. And therefore, the standardization, quality maintenance, and making sure that Dashamula Rishta has all the Dashamula and there is no compromise, which itself is a big challenge. 
Uh, however, in any, and I have mentioned this year uh, in the chat, that there is one more aspect in Ayurveda which we have totally neglected, which is the Adravya Chikitsa. And I have myself experienced, because I have been lucky to have Vaidyas in my own family or Vaidyas in my ecosystem, who were using mantra to, you know, give that added power to the medicine. And for fever, a simple uh, jwara in Ayurveda, there are many medicines and there are many mantras. So the medicine, uh, even the simple Tribhuvan Kirti, which you buy from a pharmacy and a Tribhuvan Kirti, which a Vaidya makes himself or herself, and also purifies the Shuddhi Karan with mantra is done. I myself experienced the power which is exponential. Now, how do you bring this back? And I think this is one of the challenge why Ayurveda has not been a preferred choice because it doesn't require only study from textbook or college. It requires a lot of your own commitment, your own Shuddhi Karana, your own spirituality, uh, you know, and, and the moment you become more pure, you are chanting mantras, your medicine, or, or even just your simple touch. There have been a lot of Vaidyas who only by seeing the Nadi have been able to transfer healing. So the energy level of healing or the mantra level of healing, I would say that is the soft power of Ayurveda. How do we revive that? And I really want people to also start thinking of this, uh, doing a little more chintan and manan on this, because I don't listen to this in any of the Ayurveda conferences. The Adravya part, I mean, on the pandemic, uh, I have actually done a case study on CB packs, the Chaudhary Brahma Prakash Hospital near Delhi. And they not integrative only by pure Ayurveda and yoga protocol, they have been able to heal more than 1000 cases of COVID-19 positive. Mm -hmm. How did they do that? They, they didn't even give a sim simple, any even simple crocine or paracetamol. So there is something very right in what they called happiness therapy or, or mantras, chanting omkar, doing pranayam. How do we integrate this? And this is where I think the more positive talks we have, the perception could change on its own. It, it's very interesting. Uh, there was one question here on the QA that I picked up that what can one person do? How do we change, you know, the world? Uh, and there is an author called David R. Hawkins, whose work, Power Versus Force, he has calibrated energy of individuals and how the moment we become purer, I mean, he doesn't use the word sattvic, but I would say that the more sattvic we become, you know, and we are not looking at how many trillion of business in Ayurveda. But when we look at how do I heal the world? You know, if that is my motivation, if that is my inspiration, when my energy becomes purer, my ability to spread that energy in a positive way to many more people increases many fold. And this we have seen, right? And therefore I would I mean, the sad part is that earlier, all the Vaidyas were local, right? I mean, they went to the forest, nearby forest, got the herbs themselves. They made their own medicines. Ayurveda students stayed with Vaidyas and they helped, the, you know, in crushing the leaves or making tablets. And, and they, they, they had a very strict shelf life. Unfortunately, now even Ayurvedic medicines have become industrialized. So that purity of a medicine which was originally there is not there. So how do we bring all this back in Ayurveda? Well, that's that's uh, that's a, that's certainly one of the subjects that I think we'll uh, we'll allot about ten minutes uh, for in uh, our concluding quarter. Uh, but before we finish this particular third segment, I'd like to. Call Madanji once again. Uh, Madanji, from your vantage point uh, in Cambridge, uh, and especially, I'd like to um, 
to tag uh, what we know as the WHO Department for Traditional Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Uh, what is your standpoint, or rather from, from your vantage point, does it, does it seem to you that WHO, which has a outsized influence on, uh, on our countries and many countries' uh, health policy and the functioning of uh, the healthcare system, uh, public health system, does it seem to you that uh, they would be neutral observers and participants in any geopolitics of uh, an Ayurvedic um, materia medica? Or will they, in fact, uh, take sides that we may not see at the outset here? Thank you. Thank you, Ravji. You know, there is a... The, the concept of the weakness of strength so every strength comes with weaknesses. So this is the, the theory of the opposites. And if we approach whatever we are talking, keeping in mind uh, this principle of the opposites, we come to a very balanced view of how to tackle the problem. So if I take this to the WHO, story. So uh, I attend the World Health Assemblies in Geneva the last few ones. Uh, this one was not on. Uh, we see the strength of that place. You know, you need a meeting place. It was celebrating its 70th odd anniversary then. You need a meeting place, 70 years of meeting and discussing things. And 70 years is about the time when a system comes to its uh, exhaustion. It's out like human beings, you know, it's done its time, and we got to we got to give it, we got to let it die and let something else emerge, and this is where the WHO is today, and it needs to die, I feel, in a in a not in its in in a, in a slightly more open philosophical way. There are many aspects that need to be trimmed out, and there are many aspects that need to be. Um, uh, reinvigorated, you know, you've got to put many new things into the system. And we are very fortunate that India has uh, Dr. Saumya Swaminathan as the chief scientist there in WHO. And uh, 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 Saumya's uh, father is known for the Green Revolution, as you well know, and she's the chief scientist for the WHO headquarters. Now, uh, once again, not being very diplomatic here, I, I'm going to say, what are the duties of the chief scientist? And let us take one simple question now. Now, why do I raise this? Because uh, for this year, India is also the chair of the board, of the WHO board. And, uh, in, and for many of you may not know, India is also the external auditor of uh, WHO this year. So we have many cards in our hand to force a deep question, which is with a simple question, what is the function of the chief scientist? What is the science that the chief scientist is promoting? India can raise that because it's India's uh, uh, person who is there as the chief scientist. So I'm taking you to the depth of how I'm going to dissect this problem that you have offered, uh, that you raised. Are we appreciating the strength of our science, the ancient Indian sciences. I want to put another fact into the mix here. Uh, I advised the all party parliamentary group for Indian traditional sciences here in parliament in London. We are the only parliament in the world that has an all party parliamentary group for Indian traditional sciences. Even India does not have all party parliamentary group. India is still figuring out what is this Indian science. We have all party parliamentary group. We discuss in parliament. We go into committee rooms. There, all our meetings are some of the most filled meetings. Committee room 14 in Westminster Palace is the largest committee room in this old, in the Westminster Palace. And for every meeting that we go into committee room 14, it's overflowing. We don't have, we don't have space because there are so many people who come to listen to what we are discussing. Now, deep within this is the question of science. 
our sciences are based on our darshanas. Now, a lot of us don't even know what those darshanas are. Now, to understand the darshanas requires deep study. It is as sophisticated, as serious as doing the finest molecular biology or molecular genetics or particle physics. You need to have an attitude to dissect these areas. Now, if I take this as the foundation from which all our sciences emerge, so yoga being an applied science, uh, Siddha medicine being an applied science, Yunani has connections with the system, homeopathy touching the memory of water, and uh, naturopathy and Tibetan medicine, and all this as coming from, emerging from these deep uh, darshanas, the principles. So we need to go down into the depth of these things. Are we prepared to do this? Now, Rahulji, if I can do it, then any 10-year-old school child can do it. So this is my submission here, that if I can understand the darshanas, then any school child can understand this stuff and bring it to practice. Number one, for two things, to understand this distinction between health and healthcare. Number one, so the World Health Organization that you wanted me to address and talk about right now is more a world disease organization. It <laughs> needs to transform to become truly a world health organization. And what can we do to enable that kind of a dialogue? We need it to become a world health organization. It needs to promote health, not make a essential medicines list and get every pharmaceutical company to buy into it. No, that is not health. Health is different. And only the Indian systems offer that entire package, that philosophy that is required for understanding health. So that is task number one. And yes, that secretariat is very important because they have formed a structure that connects with every nation of the world. They have six regional offices and we are very, you know, the WHO can be proud in saying that the Afro office, the African office is the first office in the world that is actually doing a phase three trial for herbal medicines for COVID-19. Our office, India in New Delhi hosts the Southeast Asia Regional Office. It didn't have, seated in India, it could not find the will to enable this trial. We are still fighting there in India as to what is, uh, what is the correct way to manage COVID. Do we give uh, kashayams or do we give quats or do we, we haven't figured out. We have, we are the home of this knowledge, but we are still in a bit of a mess. While Africa, they're into the 30th year of the traditional African medicine with a lot of herbs and a lot of mantra chikitsa kind of approaches the spirit. So there is a room. So let us see how to revisit those questions and uh, see how, what kind of leadership we can provide in those areas, because that is important, because that secretariat is important to get messages about health and not about this. Yes, disease is part of that unfortunate side of things. I've put in the chat box what is missing in our narratives today. We are missing health, we are missing wellness, we are missing well-being. And these must become major narratives within that international dialogue that the WHO can enable. And we must be proud of these things. The reason why we must be proud of this is because within this is the deepest of science. I take you into the depth of the science to understand what Malaji mentioned about Mantra Chikitsa. You have to understand the deepest of neurophysiology. We have All India Institutes of Medical Sciences that we have across the country. How come we are not having this dialogue there? Let us draw them into this kind of dialogue. Let us bring in people. Uh, last February, I was at All India Institute of Medical Science in New Delhi, 
where we were discussing this Europe-India collaboration on aspects of well-being, emergent physiology, deep, very deep principles that are still to be uncovered. If we take a very gentle shift in our thinking and just a few degrees in terms of thinking, we can become leaders in that space. And the WHO and the opportunities that India has right now with this existing World Health Assembly and being chair of the World Health Assembly, I think we must take those strategic moves and move quickly to enable those dialogues in uh, WHO and the World Health Community without missing out on the need for understanding the deepest science. It is not genetic engineering where you take a piece of DNA and you stick to another piece of DNA and you get a new gene. It does not that kind of a science what we are looking for. Thank, you, looking for for saying so. Thank you for saying so, so clearly. So these are my kind of thoughts. I presented that as, 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 uh, as frankly as I could. And I feel there is need for action and that action might have to come from the top of our government, I feel. And it must be quick, it must be deep, and it must pull out the best of our understanding of the nine darshanas and how it impacts health and well-being and wellness. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi was good at delivering this message to the United Nations in New York and to get almost a record time for having resolution passed by the maximum number of countries. And we are at that kind of inflection point where if we push correctly, we can make health instead of disease, the mandate of the WHO, well-being and wellness being a part of that global dialogue that is happening. Food 2030 is a big narrative here in Europe. The realization that food is health. And this is part of our Indian systems for millennia. Food is health. Europe is waking up to it. It is a big political challenge because the agrochemical industries will not listen to it. Very and true. with 27 countries in Brussels, I will send you the link right now about food 2030 and the impact it's going to have. So there are fighters within these establishments who will fight to the end to make food as that leverage point for checking every policy in government. They came up in the last commission saying uh, health in all policies. That didn't work because it was sabotaged somewhere. And now let us see if we can leverage food as the center of all policy making and from there spin out other things. So there is creativity in policy making. Those messages, we must be quick to respond. And I'm hoping uh, that Malaji and Prashantji, I share all this information with them, that we are quick to shape thinking and to influence policy. So I leave it there. Happy to, uh, ha happy that you asked me this question of, this is completely my perspective on how we can influence the World Health Organization and the way we communicate globally these messages about health, being health, which is different from healthcare and medicines. Number two, wellness, which is different from health and well-being and the deep messages that are there. At the same time, not missing out the depth of the science that need appreciating. It will enable a new level, a new playground where we can grow uh, the best science drawing in the best researchers from around the world. I have sent in the chat box one link to seasonal variation in the immune system. We need to understand these things. When we go to Kerala, Kerala has a very famous chikitsa called Karkadaga chikitsa, which is a, a, a special treatment that has uh, rice. Uh, it's a rice gruel, which has got about 20 or 30 herbs within it that is taken just before transition of the seasons in from the summer to the rainy season and this boosts the immune system. Why don't we do research in these areas? We have excellent institutions in Hyderabad, Center for Cellular Molecular Biology, Institute of Immunology in New Delhi. Why aren't these dialogues happening there? Why aren't these dialogues happening in our uh, Indian Institutes of Science or you know, the, the, the big institutions? So there is a need, it can be brought about. 
it can, the change can come, I would say the change can be enabled in less than two years if we get around the table. I'm optimistic. Well, I hope, I hope you're right, Madanji. I hope you're right about that. And I think uh, um, in this last uh, theme that you have given us uh, plenty of uh, ammunition to load our bandhuk with, uh, we have to, I think we have to agree that there is a bandhuk which uh, does no good sitting around getting rusty. Um, but yes, uh, I, uh, if, if, especially since we have uh, several members of uh, Indic Academy uh, also listening in, I would really suggest that uh, I feel personally that uh, the points that have been raised in this session so far are uh, critical to uh, not just for us, but for the powers that be in Delhi and elsewhere to listen to. And perhaps we should put this together uh, in a more coherent form and uh, send this to them with a with a with a, a prod here and a prod there and, and make them sit up and listen. Uh, I was particularly happy that uh, you uh, were um, I think bold enough and brave enough to call WHO what it should be called. It is, uh, to paraphrase the title of what used to be a well-known book, it is the, actually the emperor of all maladies. Uh, and uh, um, in fact, you're right, because uh, what they do, what, what, one of their major uh, outputs is in fact the, the revision and the reclassification of the diseases in the form of the international classification of diseases, which is then uh, whether it has an impact on, on traditional medicines uh, and medicinal systems is something that I think we have still not understood. Uh, the, the, the blow to our uh, medical epistemologies is, as far as I can see, it has not been looked at what, had, what it has done to us in, in terms of simply what we call the absence of health or the absence of balance. But uh, I thank you very much, Madanji, for this. What I would like to ask is because uh, we just have about 20 minutes left before perhaps uh, we run out of time. Um, the Q&A has been quite active and uh, I'd just like to ask uh, Aparna or uh, anybody else from Center for Soft Power. How do we take this? Uh, can can yeah, Rahul, if come there are some questions in the chat box. Would you like to just take them or? How do you... Well, um, I think uh, a number of them are directed to uh, one or the other of our participants. Yes. Um, and Dr. Sujit is also uh, there. Malaji, has... Madanji, Madanji. And Dr. Sujit, would you like to respond to our uh, uh, viewers who have been uh, patient enough for the last hour and a half? Thank you. There is a, we have a anonymous attendee who is also congratulating for the fact that the World Health Organization is currently a world disease organization. What I, uh, I want to just revisit a point I can see from the questions. Um, um, how do we bring about this new narrative? There is a lot of resistance, not because of lack of goodwill, um, because the depth of knowledge that needs to be appreciated is underestimated. And how to make this happen? It will only come through a series of these dialogues. And maybe people like yourselves should, uh, Aparnaji and uh, Rahulji, you should, and uh, Sujitji, you must bring together a platform where um, people like uh, the All India Institute of Medical Science dialogue with the All India Institute of Ayurveda, for instance, along with Ministry of Ayush, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of um, uh, Ministry of um, uh, the, you know, Health and Family Welfare, and the Ministry of External Affairs, and the Prime Minister's Office. You know, we need active participation here. It cannot be a lukewarm participation. We have to say, this is what we want in 12 months time. This is where we need to realize, this is what we need to realize in 12 months time. And this is how we are going to get to it. 
And these are the players here. So we don't want lukewarm participation. Somebody who comes to, a, to the table not wanting to engage and not wanting to drive the agenda internally. Every ministry is, they're busy places. And they have so many things. When you visit any of our Indian missions outside, they are firefighting 48 hours every day, basically. And they are happy for any help we can give them. They are so overburdened, but they manage a sense that they manage to give this appearance of calm, which is commendable. Uh, most recently, I've been dialoguing with our High Commissioner in Nairobi, uh, newly appointed. Uh, he fortunately is an MD, studied in all the Institute of Medical Science and joined the Foreign Service, uh, uh, Dr. Paul. And we are now working through a way in which we can bring 11 countries from Africa together around the table. So we want these kind of dialogues happening and platforms like this will be a great help. So it's, it's left to somebody like Sujit to handhold uh, Apanaji and yourself and to make this dialogue happen a little more frequently so that we have an outcome document where we can be very frank in expressing our opinions and where we want to get to. And there'll be many people from the audience who will come into the flow of things. It takes many of these interactions to get them to verbalize what is in their mind. We rehearse this six times a day because we're verbalizing this again and again and again. So we know exactly what we have to say. But for a lot of newcomers, to get into that flow of things where they're verbalizing things and knowing what the regional, the national difficulties are, the linguistic challenges, you know, somebody from Kerala might not be able to interact comfortably with somebody in the north of India. And, and then when we put it out into the region, you know, how do you engage with Bangladesh? How do you engage with Sri Lanka? How do you engage with uh, Pakistan? And so on and so on and so on. It becomes so challenging. So we have to practice this a little more. Yeah. And Rashtram. Well, thank is you so much. Uh, Rashtram, exactly. Thank you so much, Madanji, for giving us uh, a conceptual blueprint. And uh, I would really like um, Prashanji to jump in because he's often in the thick of being able to get one or more ministries to try and talk to each other, even though often it sounds like uh, they're speaking in tongues uh, and very different tongues. But uh, Rashtram is really at, uh, the, at the focal point of being able to um, bring ministries and their, um, their mandates together. Uh, Prashanji, would you like to uh, comment on what you think we could do as uh, the Indic Academy Consortium to, as, uh, doc as uh, Dr. Madan said, uh, put together a, a outcome document and push it into the right places where it can be seen and heard and discussed and, uh, and uh, acted upon. Yes, I think an architecture and a program needs to be designed to uh, you know, do that uh, integration. I mean, uh, this, this question kind of brings me to uh, revisit something that happened on the uh, e-governance scenario in 1999. Actually, at that time, the Ministry of IT was about three years old, and they were struggling in terms of integrating technology into the uh, governance functions across the country. And uh, I happened to be a part of a, uh, an initiative where we did a three-day uh, event and called all the ministries together. I was in the private sector at that time. And uh, we worked with the government to kind of create a three-day program in Vigyan uh, uh, Bhavan, uh, inaugurated by the president, um, keynote by the uh, prime minister of that time, uh, six sessions, each held by and chaired by union ministers from uh, key ministries, uh, talking about how they would uh, integrate uh, IT into their operations. We, we could look at a format like that, where we actually look at ministries of external affair, uh, affairs, Ministry of Health, child development, uh, some of the social development, uh, you know, uh, uh, SDGs, which are there, uh, which could all be kind of programmed and put into a very structured program. We, we could work closely to design that agenda and the program and uh, get the target ministries themselves to articulate and 
cohere from their perspective uh, as to how they could kind of play a role. Because I think we have to kind of push the, uh, design the program to kind of push the thinking uh, back into uh, their territories and they need to kind of come back and come into these forums to articulate how, how, how they could do it. And uh, I think the Indic uh, Academy ecosystem, Rashtram, uh, uh, Dr. Madan Tangavelu and a host of people from the Ayurveda industry, we should actually work together as a collective to help design and drive that, that program. I think we should target probably a, a three month window to kind of do this. It's a very good initiative that you suggest, Rahulji, and we could kind of drive this uh, you know, as, as a structured program and put together a calendar and a map, roadmap to doing this and making Ayurveda, Ayurveda-based principles mainstream in India and the rest of the world more, more, more aggressively and, and, and a more integrated manner. So thank you, uh, Prashantji. Well, our clock is really ticking down. I'd like to just flag one question that has uh, come up from Sunita Patil. Uh, how do Ayurveda and biotech go hand in hand for giving new innovation in Ayurveda? Uh, it's a bit of a tricky question. Which which uh, of our panelists is brave enough to tackle that head on? Ayurveda uh, and biotech. Uh, 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 being, being a microbiologist. Uh, being a microbiologist, probably I'll uh, try to bat for it. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, it, uh, my entry into AVP itself was uh, with this question, uh, how do we integrate biotechnology and Ayurveda? And probably even Madanji also probably remember uh, 12 years before we had a conference exactly on this theme and Madanji was a part of it. So uh, the whole uh, idea of integrating biotechnology and Ayurveda is nothing new. It had been there, but only difference is that uh, most of the time, uh, biotechnology tries to get leads from Ayurveda and take it to the terms and uh, uh, the regulations of the biotechnology. What we need of an Indian science has to go up as uh, uh, Ayurveda leading biotechnology, wherein the knowledge which we have in Ayurveda has to be really tapped and looked into rather than pulling one herb out of uh, what we know in Ayurveda and then trying to understand that herb in terms of uh, uh, the biotechnological uh, aspects, we should be able to uh, really uh, understand the Ayurvedic epistemology in exactly what, for example, uh, when we say uh, Rasaguna Virya Vipaka of a plant, uh, how do we understand Rasaguna Virya Vipaka of a plant, which is not told in the classic books of Ayurveda? Because Ayurveda itself considers uh, every plant to be having medicinal property. So an ex plant from probably from South America or Australia, which is not inhabitant to India, how do we find the Rasaguna Virya Vipaka of that? And these are the aspects where the biosciences has to get into. And uh, when we all say make in India, uh, parallel to that, there's something called as uh, research in India. By research in India, I mean research on Indian aspects of the science. We have the infrastructure available throughout the country. Only problem is there's some, some drawback in connecting. We try to replicate what has been done somewhere else rather than uh, trying to extrapolate what we already know. So that is the only shift which has to happen wherein uh, probably institutions like ICMR, Ministry of Ayush, Ministry of Health, and the De Department of Science and Technology, Department of Biotechnology. We have N number of uh, uh, areas uh, or uh, kind of uh, departments, but uh, I don't find a single project wherein they all come together to look into something which is Indian origin and extrapolate and use it. And, uh, somebody during the whole uh, conversation was telling that always Ayurveda has been projected as this billion uh, industry, which is going to grow in these many years into this much billion industry. That attitude has to go. And uh, we need to say that Ayurveda is an, uh, catering this many number of people. And by this year, it's going to cater this much number of people. That is where uh, really, uh, that is what the principles of Ayurveda also look forward.
Right. Uh, Sujit, since uh, you're already in the hot seat, uh, can you take a question from Uta, which is, can Sujit talk about what he thinks about bringing the mantra spirituality into Ayurveda education more, benefits and possible dangers? Mantra, uh, this is an area where I'm not an expert at all, but I should say uh, it has to be looked into a different way. Uh, perspective as as it's a very personal opinion for example there was a lot of hella below when uh, the banaras hindu university launched uh, for probably a certificate course on budhvidya and uh, uh, bbc reporting about it and kind of a boo the subtle difference of what Bhud is not understood by the local uh, or the layman or even the policy makers, and that is where the problem comes. And uh, of course, there has to be a little uh, change in the way uh, we, the Ayurvedic community or the research community or the broader Ayurvedic community present things to the world also. So uh, there has to be balance on both sides. And uh, uh, like, I just wanted to add something uh, which Krishna Mahaji keeps on telling that change has to happen inside your life. He used to say that uh, uh, your four generations should go and pray to your your personal family deity. There's a lot of subtle meaning. This four generation, what is this four generation? When I say, uh, from my perspective, I'm in my 30s. So my grandfather's generation, my father's generation, my generation, and the next generation coming. This is four layers of generation. Even public opinion to change, there has to be something that has to happen that trickle through all the four generations. If you look into public perspective of uh, how Ayurveda has taken uh, the uh, first generation, the grandfather's generation, they never doubted the quality of Ayurveda. They use it. They have absolutely no hesitation. If it comes to my father's generation, or I, I'll say the uh, second layer of the generation, uh, they are hesitating, hesitant about everything. And there is a lot of that's where we started questioning our own uh, thing. That is good. But uh, we never try to find the answers for that. That is where the gap is. This is the gap which has to be filled. And my generation is confused between the both. But the future is really promising. That is what I feel. Um, and that is, that is where we'll have to really prepare the canvas now for the future so that the things are brought back into the proper picture. Uh, there's a beautiful uh, Shailaja Chandran who is a uh, former minister, uh, secretary in Ministry of Ayusha. She once said, Ayurveda is a beautiful picture now. There's a lot of mountains and then uh, from the mountains uh, you can see a sun but only thing is we don't understand whether it is a sunrise or sunset. <laughs> she had beautifully said and it's our duty to make sure that it's, yes, it's sunrise. Thanks very much, Sujit. Uh, that's, um, I, I think that's a, a fit summary to some of these questions. Um, I have uh, just one last uh, request uh, of Malaji. Uh, Malaji, are you there? Because um, you've, you've really uh, seen the gamut of, uh, educational change for the last 25 years as a teacher, professor, mentor. And uh, what we are asking, what we are asking this younger generation, younger than Sujit, is to be prepared to take up a number of issues where we can, we can write some of the blueprint, we can put some of the nuts and bolts together, but it's going to be them who have to, in fact, finish the chasse and do the body work. But you call them a latchkey generation who are minus dinacharya, minus ritucharya, and probably weaned on junk food. What needs to be done to this generation to get them to wake up? Fortunately, Rahul, I think the pandemic has actually woken up this generation. In fact, the process of their waking up had started with what the industry calls the VUCA world, right? Uh, volatile, uh, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Uh, whether, whether you go to Isha Ashram or Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, 
and you would realize that so many or you are at Oroville and Pondicherry, you know that a lot of these younger latchkey generation have taken a break from their education, have taken a break from their careers, and they are seeking more meaningful life. So I'm very optimistic. In fact, uh, the change would really come uh, not for our, from our generation, but from this next generation, because they have experienced the height of negativity in their life, right? I mean, what was then the international global lockdown in the pandemic? They have seen so many deaths in their life, which maybe in our entire lifetime, we would have not uh, seen, right? They are bombarded with the media. And therefore, uh, I get so many at Rashtram, we get so many uh, emails and calls of people asking if we are introducing from wellness practice any courses in Ayurveda. In fact, right now, I'm actually doing a six-week course, which is a faculty development program where very senior academic and uh, HR faculties are being trained to use Prakruti as a concept. Unfortunately, in Ayurveda, the Prakruti is not really studied well. You know it as a theory and pass an exam, but focus is on Vikruti and therefore on treatment. But Prakruti, when you study, you can integrate in your style, in your life, understand your teaching style, understand the learner's style. So I'm very optimistic about the next generation actually bringing a revolution because they have tested the worst of, uh, you know, the whether we call the World Disease Organization or our wrong policies, uh, our wrong lifestyle. Uh, we were cut off from the Dhinacharya Rituchariya, but they are trying to bring it back. And they are very receptive. They are extremely open. Even Bhuta Vidya that uh, Sujit referred to, uh, I, I'm shocked how media played a role. And unfortunately, even BHU couldn't justify that Bhuta Vidya is not about Bhuta or ghosts, right? There was so much, so much fun being made. And it's sad that I'm, I mean, Way back in 1978, when I did my graduation in psychology, I studied Morgan and King. And even today, they are studying Morgan and King different edition. You know, we have lost Bhuta Vidya, which is the psychiatry in Ayurveda. You know, it's really sad that Bhuta Vidya was totally misunderstood. The way Anthony Robbins came to India, spent time with sadhus, studied Tantra, went back, packaged NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and is taking dollars, millions of dollars from India. Unfortunately, Bhuta Vidya or even Mantra Vidya, Mantra Shastra, we don't want that. So I'm touching my ears. But uh, unfortunately, somebody from Europe or America would take that science, repackage and give it back. And then we'll say, oh, wow, you know, we shouldn't do that. Let's start integrating it in a very scientific way. Bhuta Vidya, the Bhuta word came from Pancha Mahabhuta and not from ghost, you know. And media totally misrepresented. And, and, and I felt sad that nobody from the Ayurveda fraternity came forward to defend that course or project that course in the right way. What Madanji spoke about Belgium issue, the suicidal tendencies, uh, the Rajas Tamas Vikruti, uh, which would be more detailed in a Bhut Vidya, can actually help us deal with these problems today. Thank you, Malaji. Well, uh, we are in our final couple of minutes. Uh, so I'd just like to sum up in just two sentences. Uh, my sincere, sincere thanks and gratitude to our three panelists and to our wonderful team of uh, Indic Academy and AVP who have uh, been able to bring us all together. Um, I'm particularly happy that in this session we were able to uh, provide, I think, a good introduction, a good outline to the contemporaneous uh, issues and uh, opportunities because I think the opportunities definitely outweigh the the contentions. Uh, I'm glad that we have a formative roadmap, a possible outcome document, a, a likely 
uh, new scope of uh, being able to work together with several institutions. Sujit, I see your hand raised. <laughs> I just uh, ABP uh, being ABP being central amongst them. Uh, I think this is an excellent outcome to have come out of a session like this because uh, we haven't simply exchanged views and, and uh, comments and uh, experience. We've actually put down a blueprint for what to do next, uh, which is something to look forward to. Sujit, over to you. Uh, in fact, I just want to add, there's a dream uh, uh, vision which has uh, left to us all to complete uh, that Krishna Gumaji has given. That is basically to form a group of uh, people, uh, which he called it uh, friends of Ayurveda, which would include uh, people who are from uh, the celebrity category and people who are from uh, the diplomatic category and also from the bureaucratic category and uh, would uh, try to bring in a public policy or a public opinion on uh, what good us, uh, Ayurveda is. Uh, all those who have really experienced the real strength of Ayurveda come together and then create a platform which would try to push uh, on uh, the real sense of Ayurveda. I, I mean the authentic Ayurveda, not the packaged Ayurveda. Uh, so that uh, this initiate, and he also wanted a central uh, place for all this to happen, preferably in Delhi, wherein all the Ayurvedic industries can come together and have their all, uh, the place is going to be called as Trends of Ayurveda. And uh, uh, wherein any pharmacy in Ayurveda can come there, hold their meetings and use that. It will be more like a guest house, like all the public policy making or in, a, in another way, uh, kind of uh, pushing uh, the agenda. The, this would be the headquarters of pushing the agenda for Ayurveda, for the people, uh, in fact. Uh, uh, wherein uh, accommodation would be there, a meeting place would be there, the coordination, there will be people who are there assisting them. If somebody wants to know something, which ministry has to be taken, uh, there will be people there for that. And this is something uh, which has to be realized in the short term. I'm probably uh, Rashtram, uh, Indic Academy, uh, Soft Power, and everybody should come together for this. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, can I just add my, uh, can I just add uh, our media support since there's been a lot of media bashing here. Uh, on uh, behalf of Soft Power Mag, we would like to take the initiative in being the documenters and the media partners for this uh, prospective program that's coming up. We would like to support and uh, represent uh, your views in the most uh, ethical and uh, and the uh, right manner in giving the right perspective uh, with uh, Rahul's uh, direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aparna. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, that's one more step in the right direction. Well, uh, with the permission of uh, the uh, Indic Academy and Center for Soft Power, can I ask uh, one of you to then do the uh, closing honors? Thank you, Rahul. I think Sujit, uh, Sujit ji. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, when we started a uh, discussion about this program, there was a lot of things like there were three themes mainly. One is uh, uh, looking into the public perspective of uh, how uh, Ayurveda is looked at. And the second was uh, how Ayurveda could impact on the global disease burden. And the third was the new public policies that was uh, coming. And uh, I think it was the right pack of team uh, we had as a panelist. We are very, very much uh, thankful to Malaji, Prashanji, and Madanji. Uh, it was it was really uh, probably uh, this whole video which we have uh, itself is a big uh, document uh, that probably the policy makers should see and understand and try to act on. And I think we all will be able to do it, uh, put a pressure on uh, the right thing to happen. And uh, Rahul ji and uh, Viva ji, I'm uh, thankful that the whole uh, thing was taken up uh, very well and the whole uh, thing has gone on behalf of uh, Center for Soft Power, AVP Research Foundation and Vaidhi Grama. I thank one and all and of course the attendees who are there in the Zoom, uh, who are there in the Facebook, who are there in our YouTube. Ev everyone, thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, Thank you for uh, all the prospective uh, viewers who's going to see this. Uh, thank you all, uh, Aparna ji.
Thank you so much. Just a quick reminder that, that we have a session tomorrow again at uh, six o'clock, again under the ages of the Center for uh, Indigenous Sustainability with uh, Rahul ji and Viva ji. Uh, it will start at 6 p.m. and it will look at cuisines around the world and their connect to uh, indigenous uh, herbs as well as to Ayurveda. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you all. Namaskara. Namaskara.